Good morning, everyone. If you would open your New Testament to the book of Colossians, we'll be reading from there in just a minute. To those of you visiting with us, we're grateful for your presence and hope that you will be encouraged to serve Jesus Christ today, as is our purpose to glorify him in all that we do and be simply Christians in our work and in everything that we are as a church and hope that you'll be encouraged in that. Garrison Keillor has made a career in his monologues about a fictitious Minnesota town, Lake Wobegon, the little town that time for God and the decades can improve. It's the town where all of the women are strong, the men are good looking, and the children are above average. He says that in Lake Wobegon, people lock their cars in the summer, not because they're afraid of theft, but because they're afraid that someone's going to put unwanted zucchini in their back seat. Over the years, I've lived in a few towns that are smaller, where they want to keep the small town atmosphere. Like the small town when you don't have to use your turn signal because everyone knows where you're going. The small town when you can't walk for exercise because every driver that walks, drives by you offers you a ride. The small town when the news before, when the small town is where people know the news before the newspaper comes out. And I say something about small towns because we make some assumptions that when we read the New Testament, as we have been doing through the last couple of weeks, in the book of Acts of the Apostle Paul going and preaching the gospel to different places, that the letters to which he wrote were churches that he established. The book of Colossians is an exception. It was not a church he established. And because he wrote to churches like the church at Rome, we make some assumptions, the Colossae would have been a large city. Even I've made that assumption. But historically, Colossae, by the time that Paul is writing this letter, has lost its prominence. It is a small town in Roman world thinking. It had once been large, it had once been prominent, but it had dwindled in its location. And what's interesting is that you ask the question, well then why would the Apostle Paul, we awful fo often follow the premise that the Apostle Paul wrote to big churches and big cities so that the big cities could influence the smaller cities around them. So why would Paul write to Colossae? Why would he spend the time writing in a letter a, a big-time doctrinal threat that must have been affecting them? Why was it so urgent that he write to Colossae? I suppose that I could tell you this is the reason, and I'm not going to tell you the reason, but I'm going to tell you that what is in the letter is the reason. The reason that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Colossae was because the church that had been planted probably by Epaphras was a church that Epaphras had great concern for and shared that concern with the Apostle Paul. And every Christian, even Christians that Paul had not been instrumental in bringing to Christ, were worth the concern and the energy to be spent in sharing the message of what the gospel truly should be. The church at Colossae was plagued by a teaching that many commentaries and writers ask about, like trying to understand what it is, and we probably, I think one commentator said that there's over 40 different views what this doctrinal view is. And guess what? I'm not going to tell you I know the answer either. But it's interesting that Ephesians and Colossians have a very similar objective. Colossae, I'm going to suggest, is really aiming at trying to show the supremacy of Christ. Whereas Ephesians tries to show how as head of the church, the Christ, lives its life through the church. But what the problems clearly were is that there was some kind of Jewish asceticism influencing the church. 
That's seen in chapter 2, verse 11, chapter 2, verse 14, 16, 18, etc. What's also significant is that chapter 2, verse 8, he says, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. So this false teaching must have been promised by these false teachers of some deeper wisdom that could be known outside of what the gospel of Christ was. So you have this asceticism, this punishment of the body, and then you have this appeal to someone's desire for greater wisdom to be found with a knowledge outside of the teaching of Jesus. And there must have been something as well in chapter 2 about angels, because he talks about angels. And there was historically an angel cult in Colossae that's attributed to some who professed to be followers of Jesus while they great, gave great adoration to Michael, an archangel of the Old Testament. But like most false teachings, they are embedded within someone's wording and language of what is true. And so when Epaphras was combating this teaching on his own, he needed to have the assistance of a divinely inspired author to put correctly what should be rightly understood as the true gospel. Something else about Colossians that I want us to look at before we start reading parts of it is that if Paul's writing to Colossians, the Colossian church, as well as the letter to Ephesus, are parallel, then when you go back and you look at what Paul says in Colossians 1 through 4 and Ephesians 1 through 6, especially when he makes the point to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 3 that what I've written, I've written to you so that when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ is that what he's trying to affirm to the church at Colossae, and this is the point that he's trying to make to this small little church called Colossae, in this small little town, is that what I've written to you, you can understand. That the problem of our religious world isn't because the Bible is complicated. The re problem with our religious world is not because Jesus cannot be understood who he really is, because it was exactly the truth of who Jesus was that made the Jewish leadership uncomfortable with him. They, they understood what he was saying. But they did not like what he was saying, and so they made efforts to make possible the fruition of God's purpose, and they put him to death. And so too in our religious world, we have that same crisis where so many times people are plagued with this idea that the Bible is just complicated. It, it's an ancient document that, that has so much history behind it and, and so much difficulty with transla translation and all of the other aspects that we often talk about when we talk about ancient literature. We think, oh, well, it's just hard to understand, so let's just not worry about it. But when Paul wrote to the church at Colossae, the profound truths that he reveals to them about Christ that they already knew was something they could understand. Secondly, it must be clear by the way Paul writes both these letters, Colossians and Ephesus, is that in both letters, it is actually his normal mode of operation in writing a letter that he starts with the teaching the thing that he needs to address from a teaching point of view, and then he follows it with a practical application about living. Most of chapters 1 and 2 of Colossians are all about the supremacy and the uniqueness of who Christ is and what his place is. And then in chapters 3 and 4, he answers probably some questions that have been passed to him from Epaphras, and he says, and this is how you need to live. And in Ephesians, he does the same thing. 
So here's the point. What this letter teaches us is not just that when you and I read it, we can understand, but we have to get the point that teaching affects, is the, affects the way you live. That if you have a wrong concept of teaching or the theology of what is teaching in Scripture, then you and I are going to turn out living our lives in a way that displeases God. It is important what you believe. Quit believe, believing the demonic lie that it doesn't matter. Because Paul's point to the Colossian church is to start off with the teaching that leads them to the right application. And then here's the final application before we start about making this application of the letter. That it's interesting to me that over and over and over again, Paul's letters are about Christ. They are not about him. He talks about himself from time to time. But over and over and over again, the, the subject is, this is about Christ. This is about what God has accomplished through Jesus Christ, and that you and I need to understand and exclaim with the same kind of excitement that what really matters about any teaching is what does it do about Christ, not what it does about your life, because that's going to become very self-serving. That I'm going to choose a teaching of whatever it happens to be, then I'm going to choose that teaching that, that either makes me more comfortable or agrees with the way that I've always heard it or the way my favorite preacher has always taught it, then I'm going to agree with that teaching because it just sounds right. Instead of looking at the reality that everything that Paul wrote about was to exalt Christ to his rightful place in the lives of those who say they follow him. It's almost as if the psalmist in Psalm 73, verse 25, the words that he says, Whom have I in heaven but you? And beside you I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is my strength, the strength of my heart, and my portion forever. The test of any teaching is the question about what it says about Christ. Is he truly the head of this church? Is he truly the head of every church? Has he authenticated the things that we are saying are being done in his name and in his honor? Have we returned to the message of what the apostles inspired by him through the Holy Spirit have instructed Christians for every generation to follow through? Is Christ exalted? It's more than just a song to sing. It's a presence to be reckoned with. So read with me beginning in Colossians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, who are in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, always praying for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you, just as in all the world. Also, it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing, even as it has been doing in you since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow bondservant, who is a faithful servant of Christ on your behalf. And he also informed us of your love in the Spirit. So for this reason, since the day we've heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. For he delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, 
the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Also, he is the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself might come to have first place in everything. There are two things I want to, to draw from the reading. Obviously, we're not going to talk about the whole letter. But it's interesting that as Paul begins in verse 1 to this church that he had not been part of in its beginning, but had shared the excitement and the joy of Epaphras teaching them the gospel, is that he shows them, first of all, that God has equipped them in the very standard greeting of his beginning in his letters. Verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ, by God's will, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren. That, that God had put into motion a whole concept of how he was going to make certain that the churches, when they began following Jesus Christ, would be given the information necessary to make them know what it was God needed them to know. God had given apostles to his church. Don't minimize that truth. That what God has shown over and over and over again is how he had a purpose and a plan. And in that purpose, in bringing Jesus Christ into the world, he was not going to leave people abandoned with their own desires and their own ideas about who Jesus Christ is and what Jesus Christ wanted to be done. So Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the, God of, the will of God, is for them. Notice... The second part of that. And Timothy, our brother, to the saints. Not only has God described this authoritative pattern of apostles guided by the Spirit to guide the church in their knowledge, but God has made the church to be a, a, an association of people, a, a community of believers, a, a family. Even Paul writes to Timothy describing the church as the household of God. So here, these family terms that he uses about Timothy are shared brother. Underscoring this distinction that, that we belong together in this world. No matter where you are, Paul says, Timothy is your brother. He's not with you, but Timothy is your brother. That in that moment, Paul is telling us that as Christians that we must connect in reality and in our mind and in our heart more than anything else, that you are not alone. Quit feeling that in this world of darkness, which is constantly seeming to envelop us and, and to surround us with all sorts of evil and all sorts of maliciousness, that in this world there are Christians all over the world defining light in a world of darkness. Frank Walton sharing the work that he is doing in Uganda and following that, that I've seen over the last week. How excited I am to watch him talking to all of these young Ugandans. These young Ugandans who want to declare the true gospel of Jesus Christ in their world. There is light all over this world because we belong to a family. And because that family is being guided by the apostles. And then notice this third and last significant point. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father. The very common way that he says in many of his letters is that while the apostles have guided us into this truth and we belong to this family that is connected all over the world, it is God who makes it possible by his grace and his peace. Quit trying to find in your world a happiness that's going to come from your government or from your social connections or, or even from your job. Quit trying to find grace and peace in those environments 
that are inundated with the sources that come from demonic activity, from the influence of the devil in the lives of people who turn their lives into accesses to evil. And surround your life with the light that comes only from God. Grace to you and peace. So how is that supposed to change us? If that is the way God has purposed things, he's purposed it with apostles who would be guided, he's purposed it with a family that would be uniquely his, and he has purposed it by showing that family a grace and a peace that only they could know from God the Father. What's that supposed to do for us? Well, in Paul's prayer that begins in verse 9, I think the apostle is telling us exactly what he expects it to be. This is what he prayed for. This is what he had hoped that everything he's about to tell them about the supremacy of Christ is about to affect in their lives and what it's going to influence in their lives. And so he gives six things. For this reason, since the day we've heard of your faith, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you may walk in a manner worthy. You see, the message is about us walking out into the world, showing the light of that gospel in our lives, to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. And there is not in Paul's language any desire that I pray that all of you finally wake up and get perfect. The language of the Apostle Paul is not, is not to say to Don, well, Don, you're really stupid. You just need to get your life together. He, do, he doesn't pray that, does he? But what he is praying to the church at Colossae is I prayed that you will be filled with the knowledge of his will. And that it will transform the way that you walk that is worthy of the Lord's aspirations for you. How are you, how are you and I going to do that? Well, the first thing he says is to please him in every way. Don, I thought you said this wasn't about perfection. No, it isn't about perfection. When I was a kid, I still do. Okay, I was going to get ready to use a past tense, but I still do, but I loved my mom. I mean, everything I did, I, I could just imagine in my life growing up as a kid is I, I always wanted mom to be pleased. But, and I'm not even going to lie to you and say, that, that, that was, I wanted mom to be pleased, but guess what Don did? I didn't always please her. There were times when we would be sitting in the car that I would pop off a word that I heard in junior high school, because we all know how junior high kids are. And my mom's face turned all red and blushed. Never seen my mom blush. And then to see her blush because of the words she saw come out of my mouth. But I wanted to please her in every respect. What do you want to do with God? Do you want God just to negotiate with you and say, okay, yeah, Don, you can really, yeah, you can talk any way you want to, Don. It's okay, just as long as you come in on Sunday and say amen. You know that that's not it. And so then for us as Christians, if that's Paul's perspective of why God has purposed this grand and glorious purpose in Jesus Christ, that it's supposed to make me walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, he's not saying, okay, Don, you got to do it perfect every day or just give it up. He's saying that it's supposed to transform that you want to please him in every respect. Do you really want to? Are you waiting for God to give you the green light to live the way you want? Notice the second thing he says, is bear fruit in every good work. To lead a life which is pleasing to the Lord is to engage in good works, works that are good. And of course, who is good but God alone? And so for you and I trying to understand this terminology, and while I know that I can make application that he's talking about the collective church 
and that the collective church has to be engaged in works that only God authorizes. He's talking about your life. Is the life that you're living a good life? A life that God has, has demonstrated a goodness in the way that he has taught you to, way, to live in. And that's what we're supposed to be bearing fruit in, in every good work. Certainly the good works of cooking food, the good works that we oftentimes list, writing cards. There are so many good things that are done. And none. I, I don't want you to even think I'm minimizing the goodness of those good works. Because they are good works. But once again, if I come back to this message of what this purpose is supposed to do and live in a life worthy of the Lord, walking in a manner worthy of the Lord, then I'm going to be engaged in things that I know God calls this good. Not I call this good. My mama called this good. The preacher calls that good. God calls it good. Are you engaging in good work? Because that's what walking in a manner worthy of the Lord is. Loving people that are unlovable. Caring for the orphan. Loving the widow. Being a heart that looks like God's heart. The third thing he says is increasing in the knowledge of God. Another way to to make ourselves walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, is to increase in our knowledge of the Lord. When I went to Stephen F. Austin to get my degree in music education, I went there because that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a band director. And so I listened to every teacher. I listened to everything that they said about building a band program, everything about these instruments. I wanted to play all the instruments, learn how to play all the instruments. I listened constantly because I, not that maybe there was some kind of ego stuff in there that I wanted to be the best grand director in the world, maybe. But the truth is, is that I listened to those things because I knew I didn't know it. <laughs> I didn't know how to play the flute. And I still don't play very well. Ask my daughter. But the only way for me to learn was to listen. The only way for me to grow was to absorb. The only way for me to expand my knowledge was to take the time to do it. And we live in such a modern world where we're constantly busy. Our phones are constantly notifying us about our emails and everything else going on. That in this moment, when you're supposed to be growing and learning and expanding your knowledge, are you distracted about what you have to do in the future? Or is your life so busy and distracted that you can't devote yourself to worshiping God again for the next six weeks? How can that be walking in a manner that pleases the Lord when I am not increasing in knowledge? Yes, you can increase in knowledge at home. Yes, you can do that. But the question is, do you? Do you pull out your Bible and sit at your kitchen table, pull out your word studies, or go to the internet and Google all these and spend hours trying to understand? Or you do like I did when I went to SFA. I realized that there are people smarter than me, and I'm going to listen to them. Your fellow Christians are all here to help us all increase in the knowledge of God. The standard is the word. The standard is not the preacher. The standard is not the elders. The standards are not the teachers. But the only way you and I can ever increase in the knowledge of God is if we recognize we have to go and sit and listen and learn. Something else he says is to be strengthened. And notice he says in verse 11, to be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. For the attaining of all steadfastness and patience. There is nothing more awakening to the lack of patience than, that you have than a newborn child. Or maybe driving 45 into downtown. But still, there are things in our lives that happen that awaken us to recognize how lacking we are in patience. How lacking we are 
in steadfastness, enduring through difficult times, enduring through difficult relationships, enduring through difficulties that everyone in the world, we oftentimes think, you know, man, my life is so hard, and I don't want to diminish at all the reality that things may be hard in your life. But God wants you to endure them. And guess how you and I are going to attain that steadfastness and patience? By being strengthened with his might. Strengthened with the might that God is. Strengthened with the might that God has shown. Strengthened by the might God has demonstrated to my own personal reality that he saved a sinner like me. Whatever way you want to look at his might, perhaps Paul is intentionally enveloping it all. But the point is, it is God who will strengthen those who yield. And you can't yield if you think it's all in your own power. Then the next thing he says in verse 12 is to give thanks to the Father. So to walk in a manner worthy of this Lord that has purposed for us in his apostles and in this family a grace and a peace that could only be known through him. If we would please him in every respect, if we would bear fruit, if we would increase in knowledge and be strengthened with spiritual power, give thanks. There is nothing more transforming than sitting around the table with your family and saying, I thank God for you because. Don't just say, I thank God for you. It's hard to really say that you really thank someone for anything if you can't say because. I make my kids really annoyed at me sometimes. They'll say, Dad, that was a really good sermon. I say, okay, now tell me why. And they go, ah. Don't tell people you thank God for them if you can't tell them why. And don't tell God you thank him if you can't tell him why. Because gratitude creates the attitude, we say, to transform us to walk in a manner pleasing. And then, perhaps me purposely kind of taking some liberty Notice in verse 24, he said, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up that which is lacking in Christ's affliction. For this reason I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit, that I might fully carry out the preaching of God's word. That is the mystery be hidden from the ages past and generations, but has now been manifested to his saints to whom... God has made known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, Christ in you, the hope and glory. Maybe this isn't Paul's part of Paul's prayer, because it's certainly separated by space within his letter. But it must have been the very thing that was resonating through his mind, because even notice in Colossians chapter 3, in verse 12, he says, And so, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another, forgiving each other, whenever you have a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. And beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. To which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful and let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with wisdom, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. If we're going to walk in a manner worthy of the purpose for which God has planned for us as a church in a small little town or in a big little town. Christ has to be in you. 
That's what he said in chapter 1, verse 27, Christ in you. In verse 28 of chapter 1, he said, Christ is complete in you. And in chapter 3, in verse 15, he says, and Christ is ruling in you. So if you're going to complete God's purpose, where is Christ? Is he in you? As his child, have you yielded yourself to recognize that my walk with him is a work that I am to be engaged in all the time, seeking to please him in every respect, seeking to bear fruit, seeking to increase in knowledge, seeking to be strengthened with the power that only comes from him, being able to give thanks to him and to others for all the good that happens in my life so that Christ can be in me. Because that's the purpose for which God brought you to this place to teach you what Christ has done for you. He loved you. He gave his life for you. And he was raised for you so that you would see the righteousness of God in forgiving you when you believe in him, repent of your sin, and are immersed into water to begin your walk. But today I'm talking to an audience that I'm trying to encourage to continue your walk. And to continue your walk, Christ needs to be in you. Let him. As together we stand and as we sing. I praise you with all.